Hello, this is just a short recording for the Suffolk Jungian Circle um, for our February meeting at the end of the month where we will be discussing the themes of the anima and animus. Um, I've made various recordings about the anima and animus before so I'll try and remember to put some links into the, um, the blog post as to the other ones but this is just a well, quick review, um, quick sum summation of those key points. Uh, so Jung argues that every man has an anima, a feminine side, to his unconscious mind, and every woman has an animus, a masculine side, to her unconscious mind. And in the way that um, Jung presents it, often th this is experienced in youth, uh, kind of you know, teen years t into the 20s and 30s, in a heavily romantic context, in that just as it's common when we were talking about the shadow the other month, it's common to project the shadow out onto other people, so it's common to project the anima or the animus onto other people. Um, um, rather than keep saying anima and animus, we'll go for the term contrasexual self, <laughs> uh, of the, the, the part of you that's of the opposite gender to the conscious part of you. Um, for most people, uh, Jung suggests this projection is of a romantic nature. So men fall in love with women who remind them of their anima. Women fall in love with men who remind them of their animus. But it can pan out in other ways in friendships, work, colleagues, relatives, etc. It doesn't necessarily have to be in a romantic context all of the time. And certainly if we're thinking about people who are gay or bisexual, um, or indeed asexual, then a question arises as to does a gay man seek his anima, his feminine self, in another man, or in the form of friendships with women, or in some other manner entirely, uh, and, and vice versa for other um, combinations of sexualities, what are people seeking? Um, Jung didn't have a massive amount to say on that subject, but then the period of history he was writing in, that wasn't a, an issue that many people would have given an awful lot of thought to. Um, there are certainly other um, Jungians, um, like Bibi, who have written more extensively on this subject and have their own takes on it. And maybe if, if that's a topic of interest, we could perhaps make it a, a separate discussion at some point. But we'll just keep it in broad terms at the moment. Um, so the anima, the feminine side of men, uh, and it's important to argue, to, to emphasise here, that Jung is not saying this is what women are really like. He is saying that this is an aspect of the male consciousness. So this is how men understand women, not necessarily what women really are like. And, and vice versa for the women with the animus. Um, so the experience, he suggests, goes in four stages for men as they develop an understanding of their feminine side. Um, this goes in a particular order and it tends to be a um, a, a kind of a chronological development as, as the man grows older he moves into different phases and different understandings um, presumably some men will get to some phases quicker or slower than other men will as in any kind of milestone thing there will be various speeds of movement but um, it starts with what he refers to Jung as, as the Eve aspect and he's using figures from a um, mixture of mythologies here so Eve as in Adam and Eve is the primal female um, and it's not, not wholly a mother figure but primarily a mother figure uh, so the the, the ma male psyche who is in the eve stage is very very dependent on a woman which is why it often does pan out to be a very much a mother figure looking after the child when the child is vulnerable so even as the the boy grows older and is no longer as physically vulnerable physically dependent as a toddler is um, Nonetheless, for some, there may be a psychological dependence on a feminine presence onto which the um, the Eve self, this nurturing, um, all-caring self, is projected. It's Ultimately, it's the man's ability to look after himself as he becomes older and mature and go, becomes independent in the world. If it develops, if it becomes an integrated part of him, he integrates the capacity to look after himself. Um, obviously, some men, perhaps quite a lot of them, don't necessarily integrate, at least they don't do it 
quickly, maybe, maybe eventually they integrate, but for a period of time they haven't integrated and so they may be very reliant on somebody else, a, a woman, girlfriend, wife, whoever, to um, look after them, to take on a sort of motherly domestic role, cooking and cleaning and, and, and you know, making sure they've I don't know, washed their socks or whatever, um, doing all the things that are needed to do in life because they've not learnt to do it for themselves. And I'm, I'm sure there's strong cultural elements there in some parts of the world, some periods of history. Men have eschewed any kind of domestic responsibility and put that entirely onto women, um, which obviously if, if the man lives alone, his, his wife has died or whatever, um, can become problematic uh, and leave them quite sort of vulnerable and um, requiring a, a, a crutch that's no longer there to support them. So it is important that an individual develop that in, uh, that integration, not only at the emotional level, but also at just the practical level of physically looking after themselves. Um, then it moves into the phase of Helen, and, and, and Jung relates that to Helen of Troy, which he says is the, the sort of the worldly woman, the, the, the woman who's no longer thought of as just mumsy, this, this nurturing force, but is perceived as, as much more a woman of the world, and for a lot of... Um, men that will be the phase when they start getting romantically sexually interested in women um, and are looking to women outside their family circle so earlier on the eve role is mother aunt grandmother sister the kind of blood relatives um, helen is is the the interest in women in the wider world the bigger world the world outside the home um, and he does associate it with worldly success um Obviously, Helen of Troy being a queen, being the ruler of a kingdom. Um, in Jung's lifetime, obviously, um, the suffragette movement had led to more women taking on professionals. I mean, working class women have always had to work, usually in very heavy duty, low paid drudge type jobs. But um, a, a big impact of the suffragette movement was to enable middle class women to work. Um, in better paying jobs than, than working class women had and, and so there was that move in Jung's own lifetime towards f female independence and um, professional women, working women um, in better paid jobs with financial independence rather than just kind of you know scraping an existence in working class badly paid jobs after Jung's death that becomes more so and more so with every decade that passes and so the worldliness for a, a man in the 21st century is, is more pronounced than it would have been for a man in um, the early part of the 20th century in, in Jung's lifetime, that notion of the woman as a representative of the world and, and how he relates to um, women outside his immediate family circle. Um, for some, it's primarily a romantic attachment that this woman as lover or as mistress, as girlfriend, eventually woman as wife. So it's the sort of sexual allure of the charm of the woman that is taking precedence there. And in terms of it reflecting part of his own psyche, I think it would be not unreasonable to suggest that um, in, in most cultures there's an expectation that women will kind of beautify themselves, you know, get their hair done and their makeup and, and nice clothes, and, and the woman takes on a role of um, emphasising her glamour, her attraction. Some cultures, of course, men do exactly the same, but certainly European culture, for a period of time, less so. Uh, and the expectation was the woman would be the glamorous one and the man would chase after her. There wasn't much of an expectation of the man being the glamorous one and the woman chasing after him, necessarily. But as certainly we move into the later part of the 20th century, there's gradually more and more emphasis on men taking care of their appearance, getting groomed, looking nice, dressing nice, um, smelling nice, you know, aftershaves and whatnot. Um, that, you could say, is the gradual integration of the Helen aspect of the anima, of men taking on board that glamorous role, for lack of a better word, of wanting to, to be nice and look nice and be alluring and attractive for a female partner, or, or a male partner, as the case may be. Um, uh, and rather than projecting that entirely outwards as an expectation of women in the real world to integrate it internally in their own psyche as something that becomes part of them as well. Um, the third aspect is Mary, as in, as in the Virgin Mary in, in um, 
Christianity, um, the woman of virtue. So the, the idea of women as admirable, of um, men, in, in perhaps they've got past the kind of initial hormonal or romantic rush where they're mainly looking at women in a sexual context, to starting to think of women in other contexts. That could be uh, women as clever, if they are, the man's got an interest in things academic, or it could be women in a, a governmental position if the man's interested in politics. Um, could be women as, as creative if the man's interested in art, music, literature, etc. So he's looking at women less as sexualized objects and more in terms of their accomplishments. So that's that's the Mary phase, the the, the idea of, of the woman as virtuous. Um, and in terms of integrating that bit of his psyche into the rest of himself, um, that is, is perhaps something that we, we could maybe go into more depth on in the discussion, but it's um, kind of picking up on the need for himself to be a person of virtue, to not just earn money and run around doing stuff of a, a kind of worldly nature, but to, to have um, admirable qualities, admirable virtues that go beyond his financial earning power. Not that that's, I mean, that's quite an admirable thing in itself, being able to look after your family and put food on the table. That there's nothing that is admirable in and of itself. But it's looking at other virtues beyond that. Uh, and so for some, those who are not integrated, they may be constantly expecting women in the world around them to be the ones being the virtuous role models. As it integrates, the man himself starts to want to become virtuous and admirable and somebody to look up to in these other capacities. The final stage is Sophia, the, again, that's sort of a Christian Jewish element there, Sophia, the embodiment of wisdom, the power of wisdom and the feminine face of wisdom, a bit like the Shekinah in Judaism, um, this feminine force. Um, the, that's usually the phase by which most men have achieved balance and integration between their male self and their female self, the, and the anima has become integrated into the, ma the main psyche. Um, rather than being a separate cut-off thing. Um, it can be thought of as the wise old woman, you know, the sort of um, grandmotherly figure, but um, it's, it's more the notion that women have a great understanding of life and the world and relationships and, and understanding of human nature and the, the inner psyche, and that, that wisdom being integrated into the man himself. So he doesn't just um, rely on his wife to explain why the kids are upset or, or um, you know wh whatever kind of a human emotional drama is playing out in the world around them he himself learns to understand what's going on learns to read other people learns to read himself rather than relying on a woman to be almost like a kind of um, spokesperson of, of the emotional life to explain things to him and deal with problems and so well, so and so is upset right you go and sort it out I'll just go and put up a shelf um, he starts to integrate that capacity of insight and understanding and sensitivity into himself rather than projecting it entirely outwards. Um, the animus in women, again, is also broken down into four phases, which um, Jung links to various figures, only one of which is from the sort of religious context. The other three are from, um, well, the human world, the historical world, and um, the world of fiction. Um, I find it a little annoying because I, I quite like organised patterns. You know, if one thing is in a set of three mythological religious figures, I think the other one should be in a oh, sorry four. I think the other one should be in a set of four mythological religious figures. It should be balanced, but uh, he doesn't do that for whatever reason. Um, so these four phases, and again, they go in an order, a chronological order. As the woman gets older, she sort of moves on to the next phase and the next phase. And again, not always all women will achieve the movement at the same age. Some will do it older, some will do it younger, so forth. But the four phases, the man of action, which um, Jung associates with the image of Tarzan, this sort of dynamic, you know, kind of muscle-bound hero swinging on vines through the jungle and wrestling lions and things like that, um, the man of action. So for the young um, woman, the girl really, you know, prepubertal, um, the father figure, brothers, uncles, possibly grandfathers are seen as dynamic and engaging again maybe if we think about the period of history in which Jung was growing up and articulating his ideas um, 
nice young ladies were discouraged from climbing up trees and swinging on ropes it was seen as a more boyish thing to do and so we, we could see this as perhaps reflecting a little bit of the cultural period in which that sort of physical activity running jumping climbing leaping falling out of trees bashing each other up that was seen as a more boyish thing uh, and so maybe the assumption was that girls wouldn't so much be doing all that stuff themselves as watching their brothers and their dads and whoever else doing it and, and kind of therefore projecting their own capacity for action outwards onto the men around them but it is ultimately within the girl and and so as she integrates she takes on board her physical um, potential whether it's climbing up a tree or riding a horse or, or taking part in an athletic contest or yeah, whatever it is that she too can be physically dynamic and engaging and what it boils down to is having an impact on the world around engaging in the world like Tarzan wrestling the lion it's facing up to the um, challenges and the threats of the world whatever they may be and seizing it and, and wrestling it into submission so her capacity to be a woman of action rather than just reliant on men coming in and doing it for her um, oh, what's her chops Colette Dowling was it Dowling? I think it was Dowling um, who, the author who wrote the Cinderella Complex um, going back a few decades now she makes the argument that stories like the Cinderella um, fairy story where obviously the first part of the story Cinderella's got this grotty life with her awful stepmother and stepsisters uh, and they use her as a drudge and eventually the handsome prince comes along and rescues her there's kind of a handsome prince thing going on here between the, the first and the second phases of the animus in that a woman who entirely projects outwards could say my life is awful it's crap in some way but I can't do anything about it I've got to wait for the right man tall dark and handsome to come along and sort my life out for me and Dowling makes the argument that cultures well, certainly at that point in time going back a few decades now heavily encouraged female passivity with this notion that if all if when all women have problems in their lives just as all men do that a woman with problems in her life should sit back and wait for a man to sort it out rather than her taking the ball by the horns and sorting it out herself integration is the process of saying right I'm not going to wait I'm going to sort it myself I know what to do I'll go and do it boom done so the second phase is um, the romantic phase um, which uh, Jung at one point talks about the idea of Byron Lord Byron the poet mad bad and dangerous to know this this sort of um, wild alluring Heathcliff figure who's a bit dangerous and a bit rare and that the bad boy that's half the appeal of him that he's, he's this rather dangerous force that can be exciting and dynamic but equally a dangerous force could, is potentially dangerous could hurt the woman harm her in some way um, but that's part of the allure part of the charm and um, obviously there's a whole um, shelf load of books to be written about um, the appeal of dangerous blokes and the number of women who get into relationships with dangerous blokes um, who well quite often maybe end up hurting the woman domestic violence ripping her off financially um, breaking her heart etc 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 but as a repeated trope in human experience lots of women do get involved with really quite dodgy blokes um, rather than the, the, the sort of nicer gentler bloke who probably wouldn't do such horrible things to her um, why and that, that that you could ex kind of link into Jungian ideas of the projected archetype looking for that element of danger and wildness and fierceness and growing independence and the movement outside the family outside the bloodline into the men of the world as it were men who can engage in the world and have an impact on the world um, men who are a mystery because she doesn't know them unlike her brothers and her uncles and her, her father and all that where she's grown up with them and she knows them quite well this man comes into her life as a stranger and she's got to get to know him um, is he a danger is that is, is he safe is he this is he that um, so this this Byronic figure who comes into women's life and again it represents a sort of growing territory of independence fierceness pulling away from the home entering into the world of independence 
in those cultures that allow women to do that in the first place. Not all of them do, clearly. Um, but that even the cultures that don't allow it, Jung would argue the women still have the urge, even if they are frustrated in articulating it in the real world. But the urge for independence, for growth, for moving outside the home would still be there. Um, the third phase, he links to the man of words, the man of knowledge, is a kind of images, um, professors, teachers, priests, men who make their living through the power of word and knowledge and explaining things and, and, and kind of standing in a pulpit giving a sermon or standing in front of a class teaching them on some subject or another. Um, the image he links to, or one of the images he links to, is Lloyd George, which is now very, very dated. <laughs> I suspect for an awful lot of people Lloyd George would go in one brain slow and out the other but um, a political orator someone who kind of fires up the imagination and Lloyd George did have quite an appeal to women in his lifetime had lots of affairs and, and what have you um, but th this is the the power of, the, the, of logos the power of rationality and he contrasts the logos of the animus with eros the anima so even though Eros in Greek myth is depicted as a male force, he links it to the, the feminine anima. And Eros is the desire to relate, to pull things together, to, to, to desire, just not, not only desire in sexual sense, but any kind of emotional pulling and yearning where two forces come together. It's Eros is the power that binds the universe together. Um, Logos, you could argue, kind of dissects the universe to an extent in that it, it breaks things down, it analyzes them dispassionately, it sees the moving parts and how they fit together, um, uh, and it has rationality about it. So the inner life of the woman is the rational life, the inner life of the man is the emotive life of eros, of desire. Uh, which brings us, um, well, finish talking about the Lloyd George phase first, um, that, that growing sense of, of men, or, and again, historical context, Jung's lifetime, the vast majority of writers and authors and academics and what have you were men at that point in history. Um, so the idea of, of men as the purveyors of knowledge of the big wide world. Now obviously these days there's way more female authors and researchers and lecturers and scientists and whatnot than in Jung's lifetime. Um, so perhaps this doesn't pan out quite so well as a translation into modern contexts. But the, the sense that this is representing the capacity of the woman's psyche to want to analyse the world around and break it down and understand it and learn about it and transmit that knowledge um, to others through the, again, the power of the word, whether that's the spoken word or the written word or, or, or whatever, that the word is carried out to other people. Um, the final phase that Jung talks about, he links to Hermes um, and talks about the man of spirit. Um, Hermes as a Greek god can be understood in all sorts of contexts here, um, some of which are not really what Jung is, is thinking about. So he's only thinking about Hermes in a very specific role, rather than Hermes as this very developed, very rounded figure. But Hermes is associated partly with magic, Hermes Trismegistus, Hermes the thrice, thrice great, as this kind of Merlin figure, wizard figure who's got spiritual powers and understanding and profound insight that goes beyond the intellectual. So the, the man of words, the Lloyd George phase, is the intellectual phase. Um, the Hermes phase is this profoundly spiritual phase of insight and understanding and the ability to transform the world and transform yourself in a very magical sort of a way. And again, just as, as Sophia, the, the woman of wisdom, is the, the bit in which almost all men have integrated their anima into their conscious self, so the Hermes phase is the bit when most women have integrated the, the animus into their conscious self. It's a phase of balance where that sort of, of um, wizard-like role becomes part of their psyche, the, the Dumbledore bit <laughs> uh, is, is integrated there. Um, a, an understanding of the world that goes beyond the purely intellectual, the purely abstract and, and taps into some vital force within the cosmos, some, some sort of profound um, magical divine force within the cosmos. Um, he does say that the anima and the animus are not just mirror images of each other, that it's, it's a different experience for a woman to integrate her animus than it is for a man to integrate his anima, um, because they, one is, is desire, is eros, the other is um, 
intellect and logos. Uh, these, these are rationality and logos. These are two different experiences. So it's not kind of cardboard cut out interchangeable experiences for both. Failure to integrate, Jung says, can lead to, um, and sometimes he uses the term possession, and sometimes he uses the term inflation, not in its economic sense, but um, in the sense of well, like a bit like a balloon really being blown up out of proportion, where a force that is not properly integrated can take over consciousness and distort consciousness, turn it into something strange and, and, and bizarre. Um, so a, a man could be possessed by his anima or a woman by her animus if they fail to integrate it. And possession in this context is, is almost like that force banging on the door, having been locked in the cellar. It's banging on the door, demanding to be integrated. And if it isn't, it will dominate a person until they go into therapy or do whatever they're going to do and learn to integrate it. He talks a bit more about anima possession of a man than he does about animus possession of a woman. But perhaps that's because he's obviously, a, as a man, talking from his own experience. And he did maybe have... Um, sufficient experience of, of women possessed by animus to give an equal amount of, of coverage to, to that sense but it would manifest in a negative way so when he does talk about men who are anima dominated he says they often have this really tough guy image domineering forceful macho rrr, um, storming through the world and everything feminine in them has been repressed from consciousness shoved down into the darkness of the unconscious but it's there in a very negative way. So it's like the most kind of hypersensitive, histrionic, emotional, sentimental, all, all of the sort of the, the negative caricatures of womanhood start to bubble up and take control. Uh, he talks about tyrants, political tyrants, or, or I suppose you could also equally say a domestic tyrant. It doesn't have to necessarily have to be someone in charge of government. It could just be some really domineering bully boy at work or at home who becomes paranoid and the, the slightest word, the slightest hint, the sli they, they get fearful, they get anxious, someone's conspiring against me and I've got to rrr, shoot them all. And you can see that in quite a few um, political figures who make a great public show of being hyper macho, not mentioning any Russian presidency, but who react very intensely to the slightest hint of criticism, the slightest hint of disloyalty, the slightest hint of anything. and have people dragged off and shot or sent to outer Siberia or whatever they're going to do to them. Um, they, they exist in this hypersensitive state. And that, uh, um, Jung says, that hypersensitivity is the, the sort of negative caricature of the anima that's got out of control. It's not been integrated, it's not been adjusted, it's, it's dominating that person in the worst possible way and needs to be integrated, needs to be adjusted and made healthier. Um, the the flip side for women possessed by the animus becomes a, a very sort of um, domineering woman who's very um, controlling in all the worst characteristics of masculinity um, uh, love of power, dominance, control, rigidity um, refusal to listen to anyone else a kind of pig-headed single-mindedness so you could end up with some really sort of um, overbearing tin pot tyrant who controls everybody around them uh, and makes life life suffocating and oppressive for everyone um, uh, and pushes all of the, the sort of um, consciously pushes all the masculine characteristics out of their psyche and in, into their unconscious where they turn into this warped form so the, the domineering tyranny may be presented as caring the, the sort of um, just been listening to an audio tape uh, I, I like audio tapes and that help me sleep um, of an Agatha Christie story um, in, in which I, I won't, I'll try not to give away too much of the plot because I don't want to spoil it for anybody but um, Poirot is on holiday in the Middle East and he meets an American family um, which is dominated by Mrs Boynton who is the sort of the matriarch of the family this, this horrible old trout who bullies and terrorises her children and has been doing so since they were very young and now they're grown up and she's still bullying them and terrorising them um, uh, and half of them are about to end up in a psychiatric ward they're so 
constantly living in fear of this monstrous old bag. Um, but she presents it to Mrs. Boynton that I'm doing this for your good. Oh, you you don't look well. You've got to do this. I've got you've got it. So it's never outright bullying in the sense that she's punching them in the face or anything like that. Um, at least not in the book. Um, but her care, her idea of or pretense of being the nurturing mother is to render them completely powerless and fearful and neurotic and kind of um, turn all of her children and stepchildren into these these weak, useless, fearful characters. Uh, her, her, her abusiveness is verbal rather than physical. Um, so she, again, uh, I, I suppose maybe when they're younger she might have batted them senseless, who knows, but now they're adults she's she's um, giving tongue lashings rather than slapping them or punching them or something um, but she's this absolute monstrous tyrant of a creature and all of her children hate the bloody side of her understandably that would be an example um, of uh, uh, an animus dominated woman in that she behaves like this this the worst kind of male bully the worst tyrant but it's presented as maternal and nurturing and caring and I've got your best interests at heart and I know what you need and, and you must do as you're told a mother knows best it, it's disguised under an outer shell of femininity but Lung would say at heart it's this very poisonous version of masculinity that's um, kind of panning out um, and turning into, into this domineering suffocating oppressive monstrous character um, I think we'll probably leave it there for the time being because we, we can talk about both the positives and the negatives of the anima and animus and how people integrate and how it's understood in art and cinema and music culture religion um, the, the, the wish to find the other side um, of the conscious mind um, it does beg some interesting question I mentioned earlier about how this would be understood from a gay or bisexual perspective. Also, of course, there's interesting questions of how it's understood from a transgender perspective in terms of um, people who are biologically in one body but identify with a different gender um, and how these uh, contrasexual selves come into play with someone. Because um, obviously Jung is thinking of it primarily in terms of biological sex and the unconscious side as the other gender as, as the other sex but would that be the same for absolutely everybody I, I don't pretend to know the answer to that one um, I'm not even aware of anyone who's specifically written on the subject although I'm sure there must be by now somebody from a young perspective writing on the topic uh, but it would be an interesting one to consider either when we meet at the end of the month or it could be put forward as a, a topic for another day to go into in a bit more detail but it, it raises some interesting questions and this phase just to finish up on um, the, the shadow side which we talked about the other, the, the other month um, is the negredo that's the term he uses from medieval alchemy the, the descent into darkness um, the blackening which is, is essentially what negredo means this phase he says is the next one on so after you've tackled your shadow you then move on to tackle your anima or animus and he refers to this as the albedo phase which again comes from medieval alchemy albedo is the whitening phase so after the blackening comes the whitening and he says this is a harder thing to do than tackling the shadow not that tackling the shadow is easy but it's stage one once you complete stage one you go on to stage two which is addressing the masculine and feminine within there may be people who try to skip from one phase to the next um, he would he suggests that that would lead to problems because if you haven't properly integrated one thing and you just rush straight on to to focusing on gender stuff before you've addressed the shadow self then um, it is like trying to run before you've even learned to walk you're going to have problems so that is an interesting notion in and of itself that these things have to be done in phases and of course the implication is that you would be older because you'd spend a few years doing the shadow stuff quite a few years doing the shadow stuff so by the time you were psychologically in the right phase of mind to address the albedo the 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 contrasexual self you would be that much older um, so you wouldn't I'm, I'm not going to put a specific age on this but 
you, you certainly wouldn't be a teenager addressing these issues. You would be maybe 20s, late 20s, 30s perhaps, by the time you started being in a mental position where you could address these issues before you go on to the, the next phase, the citrinitis, um, of addressing the inner sage, the, the wise old man, wise old woman, which is another topic we can think about in the future months. But I'll leave it there and um, be interesting to see the discussion. And of course, if anyone else is finding it useful to listen to these, even if you're not in Suffolk, um, do feel free to leave some comments, responses, what you agree with, what you disagree with, um, how you've got experience of applying these notions in your own life, or if you're a therapist with uh, clients, that sort of thing, be quite interesting. Thank you.